Yes, and we are now recording. And the goal of this episode is basically to just build a simple component from start to finish. Okay, that's good. That's basically what we're going to do. We're going to build a simple transistor. It's a 2N3904. It's a part that already exists in Eagle's library, so if you want to check your work, you can. Um, so that's what we're going to go through now. Being a first flight, you know, we want to start very simple, very basic. Next month, we'll go into a more complex device. So for now, I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you guys can't see it, okay? Okay, let me know if you guys can't see it. Cool. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to make a brand new library for this part. So we're going to go File, New, Library. Okay, and as you can see, this is how the library opens up in Eagle 7.5.3, which is our latest beta. Not recommended for commercial work, for commercial designs, um, but basically it's just a bug fix version, so there really isn't too much that can go wrong in this one. So you guys can see we have three columns. Every library in Eagle consists of these three types of items. You have a symbol, which is a schematic representation. You have a package, which is a layout representation. And then you have the device, which is a marriage of the two. Okay? So for every part that you're going to use in your design, you are going to have to make or obtain one of each of these, at least. Okay? Since devices can actually also have multiple packages. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and visit the website with our data sheet, okay? This is the data sheet we're going to be working off of. As you can see, it's the Fairchild uh, data sheet for the 2N3904. And we're going to be making the TO92 package. Okay, that's the one we're going to be making today. Very simple package, but it can help us see the different aspects of drawing a component in Eagle. Go to our library, and the first thing we're going to do is make the package. So let's click on IC1. I'm going to put in the name of the package, TO-92. Say OK. It's going to say Create New Package. We're going to say Yes. OK, and here we are. As you can see, this is our work here, and here we can put in the, the description of the package. A simple description would just be TO-92. And we might want to include the link to the data sheet or something like that. But for now, let's leave it at TO92. Okay. As a general rule, what we recommend to do an eagle is to go ahead and center the part. Okay. Generally, that tends to work best for moving components around and referencing referencing them. So that's what we're going to try to stick with here. Okay. If we check our data sheet, we're going to notice that. And it's page 9. Page 9, we're going to notice that all the units are in millimeters, whereas our uh, drawing grid is in inches. So let's go ahead and change that. I'm just going to change it to metric, because what we're going to see is that on this data sheet, this is the pin separation, 1.27 millimeters. If we go back to the library, we have 1.27 millimeters, okay? In general, the best or, or the recommended grid unit spacing is basically either the pin pitch or a half of the pin pitch. Okay, so for now, we'll leave it with the pin pitch. We'll leave it at 1.27. Okay? And let's go ahead and place in the connections. Now, because a TO92 package is a through-hole package, okay, we're going to go ahead and place through-hole pads. Now, one thing we're going to observe here is that the width of these pins is between 0 0.36 and 0 0.56, okay? In this case, you always want to design the hole to be able to fit the largest variation. So at the thickest, you may get a part that has pads that are this, uh, pins that are this thick, 0.56 millimeters. As a general rule, you don't want to have the hole tight at 0.56. You want to give a little bit of extra room. A few tenths of a millimeter don't really make much of a difference. It won't, you know, create slippage or 
you know, the part's going to be able to stay in place and you're going to be able to solder it successfully. So if you're not given a recommended diameter for, for the pad size for the hole, generally adding an extra 0.1 millimeter or even 0.2 millimeters is a safe thing to do. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back to the library. I'm going to click here on the pad. Okay. Um, we can pick the different types of shapes. I'm going to stick with circular. I do tend to like circular pads. You'll notice that the drill value is set to 0.8 millimeters, which is 0.24 millimeters larger than the pin that we saw. Uh, maybe that's too big, so I'm going to go with 0.7. Okay. Diameter is set to auto. Okay. What does auto mean? Auto basically allows Eagle's design rules to dictate the diameter, the finished diameter of the pad. Okay, so the drill value is immutable. Eagle will never tamper with it, will never change it. But when the diameter, however, is more negotiable. If you set it to auto, then you're letting the DRC rest restring tab dictate the final diameter. If you specify, if you specify a specific a specific diameter, what you're going to see is that when you put it into the board, if it complies with your restring settings, then it will be left alone. It will be exactly as you have it here in the library. However, if the restring settings win or are larger than what you defined here in the library, the restring will win. And you'll see that on the board, the pad will be larger than what you define in the library. So that's something to be aware of, um, just in case you ever see it on, on your boards, but it's beyond the scope of, of, uh, of our tutorial today, um, how, how we're going to deal with that. So just put you aware that if you ever notice that your through-hole pads come in larger than you define them in the library, it's almost always due to the restring. Okay? So let's go ahead and place the three pads. So from what we saw in the data sheet, we saw that we have a, a 1.27 millimeter pad, and we have three of them. So here's one, here is two, and here is three. Okay, very very tight. Okay, that's the separation that we have between them. Now, that's following it exactly as it is in the data sheet, basically building exactly as it's shown here. We have a 1.27 millimeter separation. However, if you guys have ever noticed, many times when you buy a transistor, you'll receive it something like this. Okay, and this type of separation. So you could plan for either one. You could plan for the 2.8 or for the 1.27. I'm going to leave it at the 1.27. I think that's pretty good. Um, if we feel that it's too tight, as we can see here, because of the diameter and all that, we can actually just go even lower on these. We can do change, diameter. I'm not going to do that. I don't want it to be that tight. What we can do is here for the diameter instead of auto, We'll just pick it something a little bit larger. Let's see how it looks with this one. Nope, too big. Cancel that. That back to auto. Another option we have that we could do is we could choose to space them out further than that, than they are now. But this should be okay. If we look at this separation, which we can measure by just Setting it to mils, let's put in something like five. Okay, if we look, it's going to be too tight. So actually, this isn't okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go with the other, the other data sheet here. We're going to go with this one. Okay, as you can see here, it's just 2.8 as a separation. So that's what we're going to do. So let's go ahead and change this grid back to millimeters. Oops, no. Millimeters. And let's set it to, if the largest separation before was 2.8, then half of that would be 1.4. 
And we could do 0. Point, yeah, let's do 1.4 millimeters. That's fine. And we'll just change this to 0. 0.7. Now what you can see is that this one is on grid, but the other two are off. Okay, the other two aren't in the proper spacing. So what we can do is we can just specify. You see here the position, they stay at their old position. So we're going to remove these, and the easiest thing to do is just bring in a new one. We'll leave it at 0 0.7, which we had determined from before, 0 0.7. Here's 1.4, here's 2.8. Okay. Now, let's say there's a situation where you have to place a pad and it doesn't lie perfectly on grid. Okay? That can happen. That's a very common thing. You have a pad and it doesn't lie perfectly on grid. What do you do? Okay? What you can do is, while you still have the pad here floating, in the command line you can type in a specific point. So let's say that we want another pad, just for giggles, just to illustrate how this works. Let's say you want to have another pad at 2 millimeters by 2 millimeters. Okay, Obviously, that's not a point that's on grid. Okay, What you do is you open parentheses, you put in the x coordinate, which in this case is 2. Then you put a space, and eagle the delimiter is a space, not a comma. A space, then the y coordinate. So 2, 2, we close the parentheses, and we hit enter. And as you guys can see, it's off grid, but it's located at exactly two by two. Okay, we can do another example. Negative one, let's say. Negative ah, negative three. Okay, we can put multiple at a time. If you just put a space between them, you can enter multiple points at once. So negative two, two. Okay, and we've added two extra ones, okay? So whenever you you have to place it somewhere off-grid, you can just go ahead and type in the points yourself. Okay, so we do that. Perfect. Okay, you'll notice that Eagle gives these names. By default, Eagle won't show the pad names. If you want to view them, you can go Options, Set, Miscellaneous, and you select display pad names. Okay, you basically check that off. Okay. So, other thing we want to do now is I'm going to actually change the names of these pads to match what's on the data sheet. Okay. So, actually, before we do that, let's go ahead and draw the rest of the shape. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to check our data sheet. Right. Here we have the physical outline of the part, and sometimes it can be useful to have it. So let's go ahead and try to get it in. Okay, and the way we're going to do this is roughly we're just going to draw a semicircle. Okay, which is two, which is 2.66 millimeter radius. Let's go with that. 2.66, just to get a, a feel for how it looks. As you can see, we're not given a lot of information here. Yeah, we do have a 5.2 overall here diameter, uh, overall length back here at the longest point, which if we divide that by 2 would give us a radius of 2.6, which is kind of here, which is kind of within range. So we'll, we'll use 2.6 in this case to get a good radius because that's the widest point here. That's what's being measured here in the data sheet. If there's any questions at any point in this, please feel free to, to, raise, to, to, to post a chat or ask a question. Okay, so this point and this point is the same as this point, this point. We'll go with that. 2.6, let's go back to Eagle. Okay, and we can use the arc command. Okay, now the arc command has several options. We can do clockwise, put flat caps, all that stuff. Uh, the width of this, we're going to set it to, this is on the T-place layer. So 0.127 will be okay because it will be a 5 mil, which is typical for a silkscreen line. Okay. So, in this case, we have to give three points. 
And the arc command is always a little tricky because it doesn't behave the way you kind of expect it to. You can see here. So what we're going to do is we're going to enter points on it. Okay. So we're going to put points on the arc. Two points first. First one is 2.6 in the X dimension, zero. Hit enter. Okay. You can see that's where its focal point. The other point we're going to put it at is two points, negative 2.60. Zero. Okay, as you can see, we can continue to extend it if we want to. What we're going to do now is we just pick negative 2.60 again. Okay, and that gives you a perfectly closed arc. Okay, if we look at its information here, we see its length, we see that it covers 180 degrees, and it's a full arc, okay? Perfect. If we look at its radius, we get 2.6 millimeters, which is the radius we calculated before. So basically, the way arc works, instead of you specifying the center and then the radius and then what angle to run through, you basically have to define points on the arc, okay, which is what we've done here. Okay. If you want to find out more information about how exactly that works, you can go into the help command. Actually, easier still. Help, arc. Okay, and it'll bring up it'll bring up the documentation page for the help command. Okay. So let's go back and let's get the remaining stuff that we need from the data sheet. In the data sheet. We see the overall height here is 4.19. We don't know what this angle is, so we may not want to estimate it. Um, again, it's silk screen, so it may just be enough to have straight lines here. And as you can see, when you're not given information, don't let it stop you. The critical points will always be dimension property. Really, the most critical thing about this package is the location of these three pins and that they be named properly, okay? That's really it. This little angle here, this little taper, if you're not given any measurement for it or you can't find it, don't worry about it. Just square it off or look at if you really, really have to have it exact and see if another manufacturer has a more precise data sheet. Or if not, um, you may have to contact, in this case, Fairchild directly to get them to, to give you that information, okay? So here we have 2.6 millimeters, and here we have 4.19 as the overall height, right? So what does that give us? Well, the difference between, let's say, 2.6 and 4.2, because again, point, you know, one one hundredth of a millimeter, not that big a difference. That's going to be, should be 1.6, right? 1.6 millimeters. So what we do now is using the line command again, we're off grid now, so we can enter points. Okay, so we have 2.60. Basically, I'm starting over here. I'm going to go up 1.6 millimeters. So then we go 2.6, 1.6. Now we go to the right. So we'll have negative 2.6, 1.6. And then we're going to go down, this point down, negative 2.6, 0. Okay, perfect. Okay, and that basically is going to give us what we want. Yes, yeah, the basic shape. If we, Like I said, if we want to taper it, we can kind of gut feel it and move it around. But as such, I think this is okay. So the only other thing we might want to do, just looking at, at the way it's represented, we could obviously go fancy. We could draw a line here to kind of separate them. Um, and we could do that, but if we're going to do that, I would put it on the info. Okay, maybe not on the silkscreen. You don't really need that center line on the silkscreen. 
Um, we could also, for example, cut out these pieces. That way the pads stay open completely, you know, no silk screen in them, although in this case it's not really going to be a problem. But just for the sake of a basic part, we're going to leave this as is, okay? The only other thing we need to add here is the name and, and value placeholders. So we go text, we put greater than sign name, we want to put on the T names there, And we can locate that wherever we see fit. I'm going to put this here. Okay. And we're going to put in greater than sign value. Notice how I'm changing the layer that they're on. Okay, name was on T names, value is going to be on T values. Okay. Very important to have them on separate layers. Otherwise, you lose the ability to, for example, eliminate the values from the silk screen on the finished board. Okay, so it's very important that you always include these on their correct respective layers. The other thing we're going to do is name these to match the data sheet. So we go to data sheet, and we see one, two, three. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And we do that with the name command. One, two, three. Okay. Any questions on this? Any questions on this so far, anybody? Okay. Cool. So now let's move on to the next part, which is arguably much easier than this part, and that's the symbol. We're going to put in our symbol. We're going to say 2N3904. Hit enter, create new symbol, we say yes. Okay. Now in the symbol, you're going to notice that the grid is set to 0 0.1 inch. We do not want to deviate from that 0 0.1 inch. We can change it to metric, to whatever other uh, measurement system we want, but that spacing has to be 0 0.1 inches. The reason for that is that all of the other parts in Eagle's libraries are made to that grid. So if you deviate from the grid, you're going to have trouble getting things to connect to it. Remember that the symbol is just a schematic representation. It doesn't have to be precisely measured. It just visually has to communicate the point of what this part is. Okay? So that's something that's very, very key and that we want to always keep in mind. So let's go ahead and draw a simple transistor. Uh, and again, I'm going to keep it simple. You can get very fancy with the, the CAD work. There are already uh, transistor symbols in Eagle's library. They're going to be much prettier than what I'm going to draw out now. But the goal is just to give you an idea of how you would do this starting from scratch. Once you understand the fundamentals, then you can work using you know, faster methods, more precise. You can reuse, you can use UOPs to draw symbols for you. But for now, it's good to learn the manual way. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is using the line command, we're on the symbols there. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and Draw this here. Go ahead and draw this here. Okay. Again, we're making an MPN transistor. So now, if you guys notice, whenever we set the grid, we do have an alternate grid. Okay. You invoke the alternate grid by holding down the Alt key, which is what I'm going to do right now. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to hold down Alt, and I'm actually going to change it to 05. I don't need it to be that fine. So I hold down Alt, and what that allows me to do is, if I don't hold down Alt, I can only click at grid spaces, okay? But if I hold down Alt, then I can click in the middle. See? That allows me to get that. Okay? Pretty simple. Now, Something we have to keep in mind, if we notice, the way I place this, this part, it isn't quite going to be symmetrical around the grid. It's, it does have symmetry, but it's not around the grid. And that can come back to bite us later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this and bring it up, just so that I have one grid unit on either side of this origin. You'll see why in a second. Okay, I have 
grouped these two segments. I'm hitting the move command. It's going to click here. I'm going to try to move that there. And there we are. Okay. Now, the reason I did that is because when you design a symbol, most of the artwork, or in fact, all of the artwork, it doesn't matter if it's on grid or not, but the connection points do have to be on grid. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So our pin points, which are brought in using the pin command, basically always, we always have to make sure that they end up on grid. So this one ends up on grid. This one's going to end up on grid. And this one's going to end up on grid. Okay. See? See how we did that? Now, these might be a little long for our taste. Can change that. If we look at the properties of a pin, we're going to see that there's lots of properties. Let's set the length too short. We say apply. You'll notice it shrinks. Okay. You'll also notice that you can specify a function for it. This comes in handy on digital circuits, not in the case of a transistor, so we can ignore that. Visible is going to be important in a second, but I'm not going to talk about it just now. And then we have direction. We can set the direction to be either an input only, an output only a power pin, a high impedance, a supply pin, so on and so forth. Okay, this helps the ERC make certain checks, whether you, you know, make sure you don't have an output connected to another output, you know, could be dangerous, things like that. When in doubt, if you don't want to deal with, with those checks or if you're worried about getting uh, superficial errors or, or extraneous errors, the safest thing to do is to leave it at an I.O., okay, which is what we're going to do now. Swap level basically allows you to specify if different pins can be swapped one for the other. Okay? If you have a swap level of zero, it means it's not swappable. If you have a value higher than zero, then any other pins that have the same number are considered interchangeable. Okay? That's not the case here with this transistor, so we're not going to worry about it. Say okay. We also can do these changes using the change command. We can set, um, where is it, swap level, spacing. Length, short, here we go. We set that to short, we click here, and we click here, and we got them shorter, okay? Pretty simple. The only other thing I need to draw here to have a basic transistor symbol is I click here, hold down Alt to get that. Hold down Alt, and there we are. Okay, it's a very simple MPN transistor symbol. Okay, like I said, it's not the prettiest you'll ever see, but it's a basic symbol, and it is functional. Eagle comes with others. You're going to notice that they're much prettier than this one, but for our purposes, this is going to be enough. Now, again, we have the issue of naming these pins, so let's go ahead and do that. We use the name command. This will be B for base. This will be C for collector and this will be E for emitter. Yeah, and that's a little better. You know, they're obviously not running each, all over each other. But the simple itself is pretty descriptive. We don't really need to be able to see these, uh, these designators. So again, we can go visible. Remember that parameter from the info command. And we can say whether we want to just see the pad, we want to see just the pin, we want to see both, or neither. For a transistor, it's probably helpful to do to see the pad, so we're going to change the visibility to just the pad. Okay, and that's going to help us later confirm what's connected to what. So the symbol is almost completed. Let's go ahead and bring in again our our name and value text. We do greater than sign name. Okay, we could make sure it's on the names there. Put that there. We do greater than sign value, and we make sure that it's on the values there. Okay. Now, you guys may be thinking, that gets very tedious, especially if you're making a lot of parts. Eagle already comes with a UOP designed to, to kind of speed that part up, to automate it, since it's a very menial and, and common task. What you can do is you click on the UOP icon. And in the set that comes with Eagle, there's one called Set Name and Value, which is this one right here. If you just double click it, it'll automatically put them in for you, and it will put them in at the correct size and on the correct layer. 
Okay, so you don't really have to worry about it. Names, this is value. Very simple. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so now let's go to the final step. We have our package, we have our symbol, and at any point in time we can review them just by going to, to this icon, which is the table of contents here, and you can see our package, our symbol. What we're going to do now is make the device. We're on device, we can give it the same name, 2N904. Say yes. Okay, and this is the device dialog. As you can see, it looks different than the others. Again, we can put description, NPN, transistor, okay, N3904. Keep in mind that you can use HTML tags. So, for example, I can use a break to put a new line. Beta equals, I don't know, 200. Break. And IMAX equals 100 millimeters, um, 100 milliamps. Look at that. Something else we can do over here is I'm going to go ahead and make this top part bold. And you can put in whatever you want. Like I said, it does support HTML tags, so you can put links, you can put images in here. So you can really have a lot of documentation. But again, for our purposes, this is more than sufficient. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to add in our transistor symbol. You can see, here it is. Say OK. Again, try to center it. There it is, nice and centered. You'll notice that it gets a G$1. G$1 basically is to, if you were to have additional transistors in the same package, they would each be named differently to indicate a different um, a different value, uh, a different gate, but because this is a single transistor component, this is enough. The G dollar sign one is fine, there's nothing to worry about there. Next thing we're going to do is add in a new package. We click New. We select our TO92 package that we made. We say OK. There it is. Perfect. want to set up our prefix. If you do not define the prefix, Eagle will assume U dollar sign. Okay. For a transistor, we usually use Q or a T. Usually it's Q because T is taken up by a transformer. So we'll go with Q. We'll say value on over here. So let me explain what the value off and on is. If you set value to on, then basically in the schematic when you use this part, its value is adjustable. If you set it to off, then its value is going to be whatever the device name is. So in this case, the best thing to do is to just leave the value to off. That way it will become the transistor's part number. Obviously, if this was a capacitor or a resistor, then it would make more sense to set the value to on. Final thing we're going to do is connect. Whenever you have a package and it hasn't been connected, you'll get this this, this uh, little warning sign here. So click Connect. And as you can see, now we have three columns. We have a pin column, we have a pad column, and then we have the connection columns. And what we end up doing is we end up just picking, for example, base. If we go back to the data sheet, we find that the base is actually pin uh, 2. It's a center pin. So we select 2. We say connect. OK. Pin 1, which is this one right here, is the collector. And again, we can see all this by going back to the data sheet. See that all right there. See? Pin 1, pin 2, pin 3. Sometimes you'll have to mentally reorient the, the the drawing to be able to to know which one's which. Okay, so we go back over here, and one is the collector, and pin three is the emitter. Okay, once you have emptied out the pins column, you're done. Notice how I said once you empty out the pins column, you can have extra pads. Eagle's okay with that. What you can have is less pads and pins. So we say okay. All right, and that's basically it. So what we're going to do now, as you can see, 
This allows us to verify when we use the part. We can make sure everything is OK. Once you start gaining some confidence, even this you might find is too much. And you can turn those off by using the visual property in the symbol. But right now, we're going to go ahead and do a file save on our library. Save it to the desktop. F4, okay, we hit save. And that's it, we've made our first component. So if we want to use it, very simply just go File, New, Schematic. You go Library, Use. You browse to where the, the library is saved, which for my case here on the desktop, I'll pick F4, you double click it. And all you have to do now is when you go to the Add command, you'll find it here. FF4. And yeah, we can go ahead and bring it in. As many as we want. Okay. So as you can see, building a component on your own really isn't that difficult. Especially in a simple case like this one. Even when we go into more sophisticated types of components, the process isn't much more uh, complicated. You just simply are doing uh, more of the same type of operation. If I switch to a board now, and you'll see that we have all, the, all of our packages, the same ones we created in the library, OK? And remember how I told you that by setting the value to off, it would automatically take the device name. Okay. So guys, this is basically it for um, First Flight, Episode 4. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. Let's go ahead and answer questions. OK, let me see. Can you modify existing parts to make new ones? Yes, you can. You can definitely copy um, from Eagle's existing libraries into your personal libraries and modify existing parts, which is how, um, in the general case, what you will be doing is basically reusing what's already there. And I'll show you a quick example of how to do that right now. So let me go ahead and share my screen again. So I should still have that library open, and I don't. That was my mistake. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and show that. We we'll go File, Open, Library, go to Desktop, and we have FF4. Okay, here's my library, right? Now let's say I want to copy to it. I want to copy an existing uh, symbol or package to it. What we do is, easiest way to do it is you go to the Eagle Control Panel. We expand the Libraries tree. Find the part you wish to copy. So in my case, I'm going to go to the transistor NPN library. Just to do this example, go over here. And here we have the device. Here you see a much better symbol than what I made. We can also see uh, another package for the TO92 that's possible. Okay. Let's say I only want the symbol. What you could do then is if you scroll down, you'll see that the symbols are listed under their own tree. We get npn.c, npn-c, Darlington, Darlington Driver. Okay, let's just say a normal one. Okay, what we do is because we have a library open, okay, and this is key, whatever library you want to copy into, it has to be open. It doesn't have to be up on screen, but it does have to be open. Okay, we go over here, we right click, and we say copy to library. When you do that, You'll see that it came in. Okay, and there it is. Much nicer, right? Prettier, better drawn. The other thing you notice is whoever did this part basically made sure that nothing was swappable by assigning everything a different number. Okay, this is probably a throwback from one of the early releases of Eagle where the zero wasn't supported initially. So then, what we do is we can go back to our table of contents view, and we see NPN. Okay, and you can do that for anything, for a symbol, a package. If you do it for a device, you'll get everything associated with that device. So if I say 2N3904, if I right-click on that, and I say copy to library, you're going to see that NPN, even though NPN is already there, and T192 would come with it. 
Okay. Let's say something like this, right? If I right click on it and I say copy to library, you're going to see that they both come. Okay, if we go to table of contents view, there's a Darlington, there's the TO92 package that this part uses, and then there's that device. So you can see it's very easy to copy from Eagle's existing libraries. You just open up whatever library you want to copy into, go to the control panel, find what you want to copy, right click, and hit copy to library. Okay. Any other questions, guys? If there are no other questions, that's everything for today. Thank you very much, guys, for joining me on this first flight. As you can see, it was – oh, hold up. I got any question. Okay, so we do have some more questions. Let's go ahead and go through those. So one question, how to download parts from the Newark website? Okay, from the Newark website, basically you do have to have a login at 1114.com. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Go over here. What you're going to do is you're going to go to Resources, Hadsoft Eagle Design, you go over here to CAD Libraries, for example. And you have to be logged in in order for this to work, okay? So you go ahead and you find a library that you want to download, let's say the Fairchild one. You click there. It's going to take you to this page. Left click on the Download Eagle Library. You're going to unzip it, and then you'll have it available to you. Okay? You'll basically have an LBR file that you can use. In some cases, it may not be an LBR. You may get an SCR, but it'll have full instructions on how to import it into Eagle. Okay, let me see what other questions we had. I have to design a PCB with a 100 amp power MOSFET, TO220, but the pads seem always too near. Okay. If the pads seem too near, okay, then remember how I mentioned the restring issue. It could be the case that restring is inflating your pads so they're larger than you originally drew them in the board. Um, if that's not the case, then what you could do is you may just have to create a little extra space or pick a different package. The TO220 package is a little bit it's kind of pushing it for 100 amps. You may want to try finding a TO, I think it's a 202 or something like that, which is a, a bit bulkier and has greater separation between the pads. So that may be an option. Um, but if not, if the pads seem way too near, then what you can do is just make separate the pads a little bit, but be aware that you'll have to open up the pins a bit as well. And you can kind of make it work that way. On a one-off prototype, that will work. On a manufacturing, on a product that needs to be manufactured, then you may just want to reconsider the package if you feel concerned that the pads are too near to each other. Okay. So can we use a BMP picture to make a component? You can, um, like for the silk screen, for example, you can import a bitmap for the silk screen but it won't create the connectivity, it won't create the copper and that stuff. Those things you do have to create with the pad command or um, you know, or with the pins, depending on where you're importing the bitmap into. So you can use it. Um, you can use the bitmap for that, but um, like I said, really it's for the silk screen. You wouldn't want to use it for anything else. Okay, I only added a description to the package. Is there any value in adding a description to the symbol device? 
the risk to the device because when you're searching for the part, the description that shows up is the device's description. I only added it to the package just for the sake of, of brevity. But yeah, in general cases, when making your own, the best places or, or the ones where it makes the most sense is in the device and in the, the package. More the device than, than the other ones. Because the device is the, the description you'll see when you're in the add command searching for a part. That's the description you'll see there. But even for the package or the symbol, it is useful to add descriptions if you basically follow some sort of guide or standard, like a data sheet or something to make that part. Basically, it's, it's a way to, to verify that you'd made the part correctly. Somebody else can look up that data sheet and make sure it was made properly. So there is value in adding to it. Okay. It is must to have. Yeah, yeah. The, the bitmap usually can help to have a nicer look. But again, if, if you do the drawing well also, you don't necessarily need a bitmap. But you can use the bitmap. It can make life easier. Um, any other questions? Let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, if you group lines in a symbol, is there any way to specify a new location? What is the origin of a group? This is a good question. Let's go ahead and, and check that out. Okay, so let's go to the schematic that I made, because this will be a good enough illustration. Okay, the group always behaves the same way, okay, as far as picking its origin and stuff like that. So let's say we have a group, okay, and it's these two transistors. I have the move command and I want to move them. Obviously, if I hold down control and right click here, the nearest grid point becomes my origin. If I click here, this becomes my origin. If I click here, so as you can see, the origin becomes wherever you control right click, okay? I control right click over here, that becomes my origin. So if, if you're observant, you can see that wherever I control right click to perform the, the, the operation on the group, that becomes my reference point or my origin for that group. If I want to specify a specific point, okay, then what you would do is you would open a parenthesis. And let me see what point I want to use. Let's say it's this 1.1, 2.2. You open a parenthesis. You put a greater than sign, space the x uh, the x coordinate 1.1, then a space y coordinate 2.2. Close the parentheses and hit enter, and you'll see that that's where it referenced. That's where it grabbed the group. Okay, so you can specify the origin of the group by doing open parentheses greater than sign, then a space x and y coordinate of that point. Okay. That's how you do that. And then now, because you know the origin, you can also specify an end location just by entering it. Uh, X coordinate, let's say two, Y coordinate two as well. Okay. So hopefully that answers the question. Is there anything else? Anything else? Anything I missed? Okay, if not, this has been First Flight's Episode 4. Thank you guys for taking the, the time to come to this webinar. If you guys have any further questions on this, feel free to send me an email, support at cadsoftusa.com. Um, this, this recording will be posted. I will post the link on the webinar page, and I will try to also convert this to YouTube. So that way you guys have that as an alternative as well. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day.